Lord Jesus, your words are the words of life. They are a light and a lamp. They are strength for our soul. They are grace when we're in sin. They are hope when we're lost. They are instruction, the basic instructions. Help us, Lord, to run our church as your word says. Help us to run our lives the way your word says, our relationships, our children, everything we put up to the loving light of your word and ask you, please, to teach us exactly what your word says, not our interpretation of it, God, but your interpretation of it. Please, Lord Jesus, show us how we can walk in the light as you are in the light. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Today's Bible study is potentially one of the most important Bible studies that I could ever teach as a pastor because it's an explanation of things that, um, that happened at the very first church. If you've been with us, you, you'll, you'll know that the book of Acts literally is the first days of the church. And the first couple of years after the Lord's ascension into heaven, the church began. And, and synagogues were becoming places where people were worshiping the Lord Jesus. So, you know, imagine, if you will, a lot of these temples where at once they were worshiping the uh, um, Yahweh, Jehovah, they now all of a sudden they're mentioning this new name. And it's kind of a crazy thing. It's kind of an upside down turning world, which to us, to them might be upside down, but to us having uh, post-knowledge, hindsight, if you will, it's kind of like turning everything right side up. You know what I'm saying? Now what happens is, and the reason I'm saying this is because here's what happens. You come to church and the first thing is you expect to be surrounded by all these perfect people. And that's one of the things that kept a lot of you all out of church for a long time. Oh, I ain't going to go to church. I go to church. I'll burst into flames as soon as I walk in the door. You guys, how many of you guys said that thing to yourself or somebody else, right? You always said that. And you that, uh, they're not raising your hands. You're just lying. That's all you are. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you find out, wow. People in church, they're not perfect. And now you can do one of two things with that. You could either say, man, I'm going to embrace that. And that's what I did. I came to church and I got tattoos all over my body. And I used to wear wife beaters. And I was a little more in shape than I am. What would you say? You going to say something? You making fun of me already? It's all right. You getting even? Start your stuff. I'll get you. And I kind of liked the whole intimidation factor. When I went into church, people stayed away from me. But there was a few guys that they didn't. They were kind of always like, hey, brother, how are you? Good to see you. It's like, man, get, get out from around me, man. I ain't here for you. And then in, inside, though, I was melting. And I knew it, and I didn't want them to know it. And I've said this before, and you guys know, if you've heard this story, I was the guy that would sit outside the doors. Because our, our worship pastor... He used to, before he started worship, he'd play the piano. He'd go, hey, say hello to a brother next to you. He'd be like, I don't want people shaking my hand and looking at me. Man. I'd sit outside the door and we finish touching each other. <laughs> what you looking at? What are you doing in church? I don't even know why I'm here. My girlfriend wants me to come here. That's why. I'll never forget, it was a guy named Billy Huff. Walked up to me, put his hand on my back, and I was like, I was like hey, brother, it's good to see you, man. Man, good to see you. Don't touch on me. He walked away, I was like, what's happening to me? I think I'm turning gay or something. <laughs> Just telling you the truth. I thought for sure there was something happening I was like that, I've used this analogy. You guys ever see that movie Grinch? The Grinch has stole Christmas when his heart grew like five times too big. That was me. <laughs> What's happening? And I found out though, the hard way church wasn't a perfect place. The people who did things in the church that they shouldn't have done. And there was a lot of people in here that didn't belong in here. People who were doing things last night, they know they shouldn't have been doing. Who are they kidding? Guys coming in here making believe their marriages is all perfect. Their marriage ain't perfect. It's just as messed up as mine. And I, instead of judging it and running from it, I embraced it. I was like, well, good. I'm around people who are just as messed up as me. 
And then the understanding of grace became a little more clearer to me. It's like, wow, we're all in this struggle together. And I heard a guy, it was, uh, I think it was Jeff Buck, he said to me, Ryan, as a pastor, you're just a beggar telling other beggars where to get food. That's all you ever will be. And if you ever become more than that, woe to you. Woe unto you, he used to say to me. And what's really important about today's message is this is exactly what happened literally day one of the church, guys. Day one. They started meeting, and they were getting together in the synagogues. They were getting together in the temples. And look at what happens. Day one. Now, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Please, let me explain to you. Day one of the church, people started to get together. And the first thing you have in the church, well, what is the enemy's initial? What is the strategy of the enemy? Day one, Genesis chapter three, day one, divide and conquer. Divide. Did God really say, where's your husband? Where is it? You know, same strategy. So you have two groups of people. One are called the Hebrews. The other is called the Hellenists. Hebrews are Jews who believe that you still had to live according to the law. Hellenists were Jews who lived more of the Greek society. So you have same people. Now, keep in mind, all of them are supposed to be, supposed to be Christians. One are Jews who are still living more according to the Hebrew lifestyle. The other one are Jews who now are living more according to the Greek lifestyle. And here they were in a church, different cultures, but same worship. And now they had a problem. Man, I think you, I think, I think you like, you know, you, you come from more of a Hebrew background. So you, you like the Hebrews more than you like us. Why would you say that? Well, because you're a Hebrew. What does that have to do with it? Nah, we know how you all are. We, we read about you people. You follow what's going on here? Now, what happened was they had a daily distribution. Back then, the, uh, the tenant of taking care of the poor, you understand what? I like the whole idea of a, 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 a Medicare or a um, uh, Social Security, but here's the downside to a Medicare or Social Security. It gives the ability of children not to have to take care of their parents. Thus, why have a lot of kids? <coughs> the idea of having kids back then and up to just 100 years ago was the more children you have, A, you have a farm and you need farm hands. B, when I can't take care of this farm anymore, at least my, my kids are going to take care of me. Well, but now we've got Medicare. Now we've got Social Security. I really don't, you know, kids are expensive anyway, man. And besides, if, if they ain't here, at least I'll have my, my check will come in every month. Do you understand what happens here? So although there are many upsides, I love the idea of a safety net for, old, for, for, for older folks who have worked hard all their lives. However, the downside is this. And here's what you didn't have back then. Now, there were some, maybe their kids, they couldn't have kids or they, they, would, they died, their widows, whatever they were, the church stepped in and took care of them. The church was the one who said, you know what, if they're hungry, just let them come here and we'll take care of them. We'll get bread from across the street, Panera, we'll have big buckets of it, and if they need it, we'll just give it out to them. You know what was happening, though? The Hebrews were waiting online first, and the Hellenists said, wait a second, why are you taking care of the Hellenists? Why are you taking care of the Hebrews instead of the Hellenists? And all of a sudden, we have a problem here. Now, according to scripture, what should be done when there's a hassle in the church? Somebody in the church does you wrong, what should we do? What you should do is go to the pastor and tell him this person did you wrong because that's what... No, that's not what you're supposed to do. According to Matthew 18, 15, you go to that person one-on-one, -on -one, you know, here's what happened. I could be wrong, but here's what went down. And now the Bible says, if that person repents, you've gained a brother, you've gained a friend. If he doesn't repent, then you go with another two or three people. You confront that person. If he still doesn't repent, then you go to the church. And that's how it works. It's an amazing thing that the scripture actually works, doesn't it? It does. Now, problems in the church have always existed. 
A pastor friend of mine told me many, many years ago, and I'll never forget it, and I've probably said this from the day one of the church, if you're looking for the perfect church and you find it, don't join it because you'll ruin it. We don't do everything right here. And there's a lot of imperfect people here. And I might say something dumb, and one of the elders or leaders or deacons might say something, uh, might not say something, they might recognize or not recognize. Please know this. These problems started day one of the church. Another brother of mine told me, hey, Ryan, there was only one perfect person. And you see what they did to him? Continuing. Verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Please let me explain to you what's going on here. You have the disciples, the original apostles, these twelve men whose lives have now been completely transformed by walking with the Lord for the past three years, who saw him get crucified, saw him rise from the dead, and saw him ascend into heaven. And they had one mission in their life now, and that was to let other people know about the power of God. But when you're trying to hold down a job, when you're trying to keep a family together, and trying to do ministry, now you add these problems of the church to it. So they said, listen, here's what we have to do. This is what some would people would call the first appointing of the deacons. The word deacon means servant. So the actual apostle said, you know what? We can't neglect the preaching of the word, the studying and prayer to take care of these, all these problems. That's all we would ever do. All churches are is a bunch of people with problems. And thank God. However, let's appoint some who could take care of these problems. That was not a condescending thing. Now, there's a double-edged sword here. You can't be one of those people who thinks you're too high and mighty to take care of a table if it needs to be taken care of. But just the other time, you can't be a one take care of the table if there's other things to be doing. If we have people in here that need ministry and prayer, and you have the experience, and you have the, the knowledge of the Word of God, but there was a big mess out there, and you're on your hands and knees cleaning it up, well, it's beautiful that you're on your knees and knees cleaning it up, but there's people that need ministry. We have to prioritize by necessity, by ability. Do you understand what I'm saying? Very fine line here, guys, and it's very interesting. But remember what I said at the beginning. It's really important, this Bible study. You've got to wrap your head around this, that these things are, this ain't a place where a bunch of people come and sing Kumbaya. I mean, nobody here I know, they ain't seen yet, that has a perfect marriage. Everything's just peachy keen at home with the wife and kids. You came to the wrong church then. That's up the block. The church of the all perfects. Verse 3. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Please give me your attention again. And there's really an interesting thing that goes on here. I want you to know something. Please understand that here as the senior pastor of this church, and it is normal to exalt the guy that's preaching. First thing you do when you go to church is you look at the guy preaching and go, wow, wow, man, that dude, man. I remember looking at this guy that was preaching, and, and, and he'd preach the word, and my heart would just burn within me. And I said, man, this guy is some amazing preacher. And I just want to go tell every man, I'm telling you, we have, a pre we have a preacher at our church. I'm telling you, God hasn't poured his spirit out like this in a long time. There is something going on with this guy. And he would often say from the pulpit, guys, please don't look to me. I'm going to let you down. Look to the Lord. The Lord will never let you down. Look to the word. It's perfect. It has everything you need. When I first started the church, I was worried that I wouldn't have a, a feeding. I wouldn't be able to get. I know for me, when I go to church, it was, oh my, 
When I went to church on Sunday, I was so filled. I, I felt so good after I left here. Like all the burdens of my heart were released. Like I, I just felt lighter. But by Monday night, man, it started all over again. It's like, mmm. Man, Wednesday would come around. It's like, man, this church on Wednesday, I got to get, get into church again. And Wednesday, I'd feel, oh, I feel filled again, man. And then by Thursday night, it'd be the start that. And, and when I first started church, I called my friend Ken up and I said, Ken, I said, man, how am I going to get fed now that I'm going to be starting a church and I'm not going to be going to church every week? And he rebuked me sharply. He said to me, Ryan, from now on, you've been, you, be, you should be feeding yourself. And it just, it all fell into place right there. It's the truth. My job as a pastor is to get you guys to feed yourselves. My job as a pastor is to get you guys serious about your relationship. Whatever reason it is that you came here to a church, to this church in the first place, hopefully by the time that you're finished coming here, you realize that you're coming here because you love the Lord. And that when you come here, you're ministered to by the Word of God. But you could get that ministry yourself. Yes, I have my job as a pastor. And yes, it is normal to look at the pastor and exalt him. But know this, going back again to the point of the Scripture, I can tell you right now, you are surrounded by men and women of God who love the Lord every bit as much as I do and know the word every bit as much as I do and will minister to you every bit as much as I do. You probably don't even know it. We have at this church deacons and elders. We have associate pastors, and they love the Lord. Now, I get the blessing, and it is an honorable blessing to sit up here and be the centerpiece, the focal point, the one who gets all the glory. But know this. I can't do jack without these guys I'm surrounded by. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, this was a birth in my heart that God gave, a vision that God gave to me and my wife to start a Bible study. But unless it was for the deacons and the elders and the associate pastors of this church, when I tell you something, we would be nowhere. I know that wholeheartedly. And you'll hear me mention them all the time. I talk about the, el the elders. I talk about my brother Matt and I talk about Pastor Dean, and I talk about um, Brian, or I talk about, I, you guys hear me talk about Steve. We joke around with each other. Do you have any idea how long I've been serving alongside John Yancey? How many years has it been now, John? 20-something. You remember back in the old when we were doing softball ministry together, and we'd have monthly meetings with the sports ministry? Do you have any idea these guys have kept me strong and in line and if it wasn't for my son-in-law, who every day I have to say, don't blow it, if he's looking at you. He's looking at you. Don't blow it. He's looking at you. Don't blow it. This is these men, and you are surrounded by them. And here's the question I want to ask you. Are you potentially one of them? I remember one time that I had my heart broken in church. I was new in church. I was, I was, I was about six, seven years old in the Lord. And I, I think I had just crossed that line over to going to church to really, you know what? This is who I am now. It's kind of this weird thing where you, you go from, let's use light and darkness as it. You come to church and you're all white. And you come here and the sun just shines upon you. And at some point in time, your skin gets this coating. And it gets browner and darker and darker and darker and darker. Till now, that's who you are. People don't see me as they used to see me anymore. I'm not that white dude anymore. Now, I know that there's like a weird thing I just did there, the whole white. Let's forget about all that stuff, though. No, understand the analogy that I'm making. I'm not who I was anymore. And although I embraced that for so long, I want to be that, 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 that badass. I want to be that guy. I, I'm not. I don't want to be that guy anymore. You know who I just want to be now? I just want to be Christian Ryan. When I was growing up in the Lord, there was a guy named Bob Cunningham, and everybody called him Christian Bob. He had so many unsafe friends, and his nickname, oh, that's that Christian Bob guy. What, that's, a, that's, a, that's the testimony. Oh, that Christian, Christian guy over there, the, the religious dude. That's what I want to be. Get rid of all the white. I just want to be basking in that sun till it's dark and golden brown. You follow what I'm saying? So maybe 
You want to be one of those guys, one of those gals. Where do you put it up against? How do you look in it? Because before you have the deeds down, you have the desire to be that. But is there a standard I should be looking for here? Is there, you know, what is it? Because sometimes you don't even know. I'm glad you asked that question, and I asked it for you, I know. Turn to the, to the right to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to look at the second chapter of 2 Timothy. Now, here's what I want you to know. Did I say 2 Timothy? I meant 1 Timothy, please. 1 Timothy, chapter 3, just to the right. Now, here's what happens, guys. You wonder, what are the qualifications and do you follow them? Well, again, there's a fine line and it's a, believe me when I tell you, it's a broad and blurry line between wanting to and accomplishing. But believe it or not, there are those who disqualify themselves from ministry. But what are the qualifications of somebody who truly wants to be a deacon? What if you're here and your desire is to be a deacon? Man, you know what? I've been going to this church. What, do they make deacons? Because I was at my old church and they had this whole deacon thing that they did. And when do you become an elder? And, you know, do I have to sign paper? Do I have to fill out? Here's the thing. And, and um, this is just a personal thing. This is not a Calvary Chapel thing. This is not a, this is a Ryan thing. I believe wholeheartedly God makes men what they are. I started this church and I didn't get ordained as a pastor for almost five years after because I just didn't care. God makes men what they are. We've had two ordinations at this church, two, in 13 years. God will raise up men, and if they want to stick around, they must be a deacon before they are appointed deacon. And maybe I'm behind the times. We had a couple of people that we appointed upon potential, and that didn't work out so good. Because they looked like they had the heart for it, so we said, okay, let's make them a deacon, and I shouldn't have done that. So at this point, I'd rather be behind God on this stuff than in front of God on this stuff. Do you follow what I'm saying here, guys? You guys with me? So along those lines of what does a deacon, a pastor, an elder, a bishop, what the Bible calls look like? Chapter 3, the book of 2nd, I'm sorry, the book of 1 Timothy. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires a position of a bishop, which more we would call a elder... He desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. Now you notice it says blameless, not sinless. Now there's a huge difference between blameless and sinless. Blameless is somebody who understands their sin and knows they need God. Therefore you are not blamable because you have been forgiven by God. Because the Bible says in 1 John, if anybody says he doesn't sin, he's a liar. We know that. The husband of one wife, got that one down, Pat. Temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetousness, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take the church how will he take care of the church of God? Now, you see that word for rule? That doesn't mean rule like we think, oh, how? A man's supposed to rule over his own house? You show me a man who thinks he rules over his own house, and I'll show you a man who's not married. That means controlling with loving emotion through whatever. That doesn't mean rule. I rule my house. I don't rule my house. Ask her. Do I rule my house? She said, no comment. <laughs> Not as a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. They call him Christian Bob. Lest he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons, okay, here we go. Deacons must be reverent not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, 
not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Oof. Man, Ryan, it sounds like nobody's going to be a deacon. Again, yes, you're right. There's that fine line between what you desire to be and what you are. However, know this. There's also a broad line between duplicitous and sincerity of heart, meaning this. Duplicitous is somebody who says they're one thing but another, which is basically hypocrisy. And there's another person who's desiring and trying the best that they can do. And they know they fall short, but they're not making believe. They're doing the best they can. And the job of the church, notice that when we were reading through the book of Acts, it said, he didn't call for the, uh, the church. I'm sorry, they didn't call for the apostles to pick these men out. They called for the church at large. Call for the people and tell them to choose seven men from among them who have a good reputation. You see, we'll go back to that in a second. Continue to a book and a half later to the book of Titus. He expounds on it even more. The same writer who wrote 1st and 2nd Timothy also wrote the book of Titus. It's the Apostle Paul. Skip down from, from in chapter 1 of the book of Titus. Everybody's in Titus. Look at verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convict those who contradict. Please know this. Nobody becomes these things by accident. When I was asked to be a deacon at my old church, I had to look these things up and I had to go, man, I got some work to do first. I got some work to do first. Because that whole self-control and temperate thing, I ain't really there yet. So when they asked me and they said, hey, we want you to be a deacon, I was like, you got the wrong guy. I don't, I don't line up. And, and I ain't playing this game for you. I didn't come here to climb the ladder, to be appointed. I came here to follow Christ. I, I, what I like about this place, the church I was, uh, that, I, what I liked about the mindset of my church was there was no more striving. I, I, I try to be the big guy, the bad guy in the, in the, in the street. I don't want to be that guy no more. I, I want to be, a, could I just be a, a nobody who just loves his wife and kids? That was just enough for me at the time where I was at. You guys understanding where the line is? Duplicitous, hypocrisy, sincerity, good heart at attempting these things. So when you look at these things, if I'm saying these things to you now, and some of you guys are in one or two places. Here's where you're, no, maybe it's more than two places, but here's the two places I'm thinking. Number one, you're like, well, I know this guy does this, does that, and the other, the other thing. He's full of crap. I mean, he here make him believe he's somebody, but he ain't. Or there's a heart here of a, of, of a man or a woman that's in here go, man, I want to have a good testimony for God, but I'm just so weak, and there's no way I'm going to attain those things. And it reminds me very much of the story that the Lord Jesus himself said. There's two men. And they go to the temple looking for justification. And one beats his breast and says, God, don't even look at me. I'm unworthy. And another one says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like this dude. So who do you think? One guy who had all the acts or another guy who was just broken? And the Lord Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the guy that was broken, he's the one that went away justified. Continuing, verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers, talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, 
not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even in their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. But as for you, quote-unquote, deacon, quote-unquote, pastor, quote-unquote, elder, quote-unquote, bishop, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent, in, reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the younger men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say about you. There was a man in the church when I was growing up. This, he was about five foot six. He had the biggest, fattest attitude you've ever seen in your life. And when I tell you from the heart, I couldn't stand this guy, I couldn't stand him. I couldn't stand him. And what was worse, he wasn't afraid of me. He used to look at me and he used to say, I know who you are. I know what you think you do. I know you need to do this. And he's always telling me what I should and shouldn't do. And in my heart, being young in the Lord, two, three years old, I was like, man, Fire bomb his car. <laughs> Watch, something's gonna happen. He's gonna come out. He's gonna be. He's gonna be cheating on his wife. Watch. He's gonna be like one of those guys. You're gonna find out. <sighs> and he had started a ministry in his house. He was married, but he had young men living in his house. I was like, yeah, find something to accuse him of. Find out he was like a pastor at the church and. Oh, he's hell. All I heard was good things about him from everybody. I know him, though. He told me. He's going to tell me where it's at. But his life was a testimony of good works. And he did what these words said. He rebuked. He kept sound doctrine. He told me his name was Generino De Stefano. And he used to always, Ryan, Ryan, I know what you are. You ain't fooling me. I know where you drive. I know where you could end up tonight, too. And if I tell you the truth, every once in a while, you'll come back here tonight. I have this little black Bible. It's about this big. When I got ordained, he gave me that Bible. And he spoke at my ordination. And he said, I couldn't be more proud of this young man. He said, I love this man so much. I love you too, Pastor. And all he did was have a pattern of good works in his life. And, uh, his personality might not have matched mine. It's probably because he was more like me than I cared. <laughs> but his life was a pattern of just good works, man. That's it. So everybody that hated him, they had nothing to say about him except he does a lot of ministry. <laughs> it's his problem. He does so much ministry. You can't find nothing wrong with the guy. Verse 15 Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. That's what he did. That's exactly what he did. He spoke with authority. He exhorted me, but he rebuked me. And he didn't care that I hated him. He knew I hated him. Remind them, verse 1 of chapter 3, to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hate, and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. But I want you to avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. When I send you, when I send Artemis to you, don't worry about the rest of that. Listen, the men that we look as leadership have these things. If you are here now, please understand. This is a good thing to strive for. And if you are doing these things now, more than anybody that sees it, the Lord God sees it. And I guarantee you, your wife sees it. No matter though she doesn't tell you all the time, she's probably a little bit like uh, Generino. That's okay. It's okay. That was a joke. I'm going to get in trouble for it later. Turn a few pages to the right. First Peter, chapter five of First Peter. This is where we're going to bring it closer to a close, but not end yet. And this is just something I'm saying to make you think we're ending soon, so I can refocus your attention back on the word. Truth, that's all. Just being truthful. Five, chapter five, first Peter. Again, on the subject of elders, deacons, and bishops, verse one of chapter five. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I want you to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Back, please, to the book of Acts, the sixth, ver the sixth chapter. We're going to pick it up in the fifth verse. So now, we're about to hear now of somebody named Stephen. Who, if you know scripture, wow, yes, I know that name. What's, what's the story with him? Well, he's the first martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R. -R. If you've never heard that word, it's the first person in the Bible out of the apostles who died for their faith, strictly because he believed in the Lord. Nobody heard of him before. You don't hear about him any, of the, any place else. All of a sudden, this guy pops up, and I want you to know that's how it becomes. When you're sincere about the Lord, when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, all of a sudden, even though you could have been somebody who did jail time, somebody who did prison time, you could have been a drug addict, you could have been a, a prostitute, you, you could have been anything from, and, and I'm not using this as any example for any other reason, you could have been gay, straight, trans, anywhere, any, it doesn't matter. When the love of God takes over your heart, nothing else matters. And it's not going to make you into the image and here's what happens. Here's what we think. Okay, well, of course, a pastor is going to be, well, if it's a black church, he's going to be really Pentecostal. If it's a white church, he's going to be really straight. If he's going, forget, wash all that away. Take any preconceived notion you have about any of that stuff. When the love of God overtakes your heart, here's what it's going to be. You're going to be you. You're going to be you. Loving God and sincere about how you walk with your life. Do you understand? All that other stuff means nothing. 
means nothing. There is no tag. There is no past. There is nothing that God cannot redeem about you. Nothing. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Please, guys, you understand? They found these guys and they said, you know, there's some guys here we haven't recognized. Yeah, there's a few guys here I see that if we ever do do a, a, a calling for deacons, yeah, we're going to call you guys up and we're going to anoint you with oil. We're going to lay hands on you. Now, if you guys remember, earlier in, in the there was a laying hands on, but a different type of laying hands on. This is just how we do it. We all lay hands on and we pray. And this is how it was a, signi it was a signifier to the body of Christ, but it was also a calling for whatever it is that's in us that we could lay hands on and transfer to them in some, I want to say, supernatural way. You guys with me on this one so far? So here they took these men, they took these seven men, they became the first deacons, they laid hands on them. Verse 7, then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples was multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some of what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Please, before we go to verse 11, this is kind of the last part of the message, the last thought before we close. There was these people from another church who didn't like what they were doing. And they thought to do God a service by going and straighten them out. There was the synagogue of the freedmen. What makes us so sure that what we're doing is right and what anybody else is doing is wrong? Are we Calvary Chapelites for any particular reason? Maybe Baptists are the ones who got it down. Hey, maybe it's the uh, Muslims that got it down. Maybe it's the Mormons who got it down. Who knows? Are you with me? We don't claim to have it down. Here's what we claim to do. Follow the Bible. We preach chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and in our opinion, in our humble opinion, there is no other name by, men, by which men may be saved except the name of Jesus. That's it. Well, the Mormons don't believe that. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that. The so-and-sos don't believe that. That's their business. Well, shouldn't we... Listen, if you feel led to go out and do a ministry outreaching to the Mormons, outreaching to the Muslims, outreaching to Jehovah Witnesses, outreaching to Catholics, outreaching to whoever else, you know what? Praise God. You go do your thing. And uh, if you want some eldership and you want some help with that, I don't know, maybe we'll call for the elders, we'll do some studies, we'll help you out. But that is not what we do here. What we do here is teach the Word of God. Well, what about this Word of Faith church up the block? Are they saved? Did you ask me if they were saved? I don't know who's saved and who's not. Here's what I know. I'm staying in the love of Christ. I'm saved. Well, what do, you, do you think I'm saved? I don't know if you're saved or not. I don't know what's going on in your heart. Maybe you're just being duplicitous. Maybe you're just doing this for a show. Maybe you came here because we have a, a, a lot of attractive women in our church. Maybe you came here because you're looking for a man and you heard about the, this ministry and we got all these nice looking men here who love God and you just want a Christian husband. Maybe. I don't know. But these people, and to me, this is the indicator. When you have to go to another church to straighten them out, what are you afraid of? We used to have this in the old days. It was interesting. There was a church in, called, it was originally the, um, the, it's called the Church of Christ. They originally started in Boston. They were originally called the Boston Church of Christ. But when it grew bigger, they called themselves the Church of Christ. And they believed wholeheartedly that unless you were baptized, you weren't saved. What they would do is they would come to our services. 
And at the end of our services, our pastor would do an altar call, and sometimes 100 people would get saved. Me and Dean served in that ministry together for years. And we'd be the first person they met, and we'd say, hey, guys, congratulations on a great decision. And what we want to do is we want to split you up into some group, separate groups here, and you would do this. And you'd talk to them, and, they'd get, and, and all of a sudden you'd go, and we'd go, you can tell everybody got to be baptized? And they're like, are you from the Boston Church of Christ? <laughs> yes, I am. You know I was baptized, right? Yes, but are you going to tell these other people? They literally show up to our church to tell us we're doing it wrong. Like, dude, why don't you just do your own thing? Are you baptized? Why isn't it? Well, we think you're condemning people to hell, and this is a church of Satan. And like, you know, and, and, un, and a newbie like myself, I'm like, Pastor, let me just put this son of a gun to sleep. Let me just choke him out. I'm telling you, like, Ryan, that's not what we do here. Like, but why are they going to come to our church? Why do they want to come to our church and do, Ryan, this is a snare and a trap. And this is also a test. If, you, if somebody can't come to your church opposing you and you love on them, then this is not the position for you. And for me, as a young believer, again, six, seven years old in the Lord, it's a young person in the Lord to be serving Christ. It's like I had this very Hulk mentality. But, but Hulk wants to smash. <laughs> but Ryan, this is not time for Hulk to smash. But this person needs smash. You let God smash. But Ryan worked for God now. Ryan smashed for God. We don't smash for God. We love for God. You understand what we're saying? And all of a sudden, there popped up around the body these men who loved the Lord. And nobody even heard of them. You didn't even know. They just loved God. And they went out and shared the word of God. And they didn't ask permission. They just invited people to church and invited people to the Lord. You know, people want to do that. Should I invite people to church? No, here's what I want to do. I want you to be prepared enough to invite people to the Lord. And if they want to come to church after that, praise God. But don't invite them to church, okay? Invite them to God. Now, I have no problem if you invite people to church. I don't want to be, be thought wrong. Invite them to church, that's fine. But I want you to be prepared enough to invite them to the Lord. Especially you young people here. If you're... Under 20 here, oh, man, do I have sympathy for what you have to live in in this horrible world. Are you inviting them to the Lord, though? It's a tough, tough call. And the power of this world is so strong. The, the grip of, of um, the mob mentality is on you. Mm, my heart breaks for you. But if you can start now, if you can be invited into the Lord now, if you could tell them about your Savior and tell them why, hey, no, I don't, I don't do that. What do you mean you don't do that? I'm a Christian. You're a Christian? I just feel led to tell a story. I remember the first time I heard Jim Coy um, preach. He's, he's my pastor. His name is Jim Coy. He's actually in town. He's up at uh, Ryan B's church up in Wellington. And he, uh, he said this story that he got saved and he was working construction. And after a few months of walking with the Lord, he knew this was the life for him. It had given him forgiveness and, and healing that he'd so uh, waited his whole life for. And he was on a job and everybody was making fun of Christians on his job. And he finally had, a, you know, had enough. There was this big then. If you know Jim Coy, he's like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, and, and he's a skinny little dude. And he was on the job working and they were making fun of Christians. And there was this big dude that was looking at him. And he was like, what? You, you got something to say, too? And he's like, man, he was ready. He was just done with it. And the guy looked at him and said, you, you're, you're one of those Christians? And he said, that was it for him. He said, he, it was going down right there. He was sick and tired. And he was, yeah, you have a problem with that? And he said, this big guy looked at him, walked over, and he leaned down, and he said, so am I. <laughs> and that's, they're, they're around you, and they're afraid, and they're just looking they're looking for brotherhood. They're looking for, they want to say to you, so am I. But if you ain't living it, they ain't living it. They're looking for strength to hold on to just so they can look at you and say, so am I. I remember that story. I'll never forget that story. It's like 23, 24 years ago that I heard that story. 
and lastly, um, where do we leave off? 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God, and they have stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard from him, I'm sorry, for we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. The plot is still the same today. You can close your Bible if you want. You are pigeonholed into being and saying and doing things that you never were, never said, or never did. You're a Christian, you must be anti-gay. You're a Christian, you must hate this person. You must, you must be a racist if you, you must be... Whoa, 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 whoa. Where's that come from? Because that ain't us. Where's that us? And this is exactly where we're at now. They want to, there's, there's forces in the government that want to stop us from having the um, tax exemption. Why? Well, they say because there's hate speech in the church. Why? Well, because in this Bible it says that's a sin. This is a sin. That's a sin. You must want to rip babies from the arms of mothers coming across the border. You must want to, and here's how they pigeonhole you, and this is exactly what this synagogue of the freedmen said about Stephen. You believe in that Jesus is the only way to heaven? How many of you guys that are here right now believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Oh, so you're condemning other people to hell, huh? So you think Muslims go to hell, Mormons go to hell? Is that what you're saying? That's why they want to take away... And that's exactly what they were doing. Wait a second. He said this, and now Stephen, so filled with the Spirit, they looked at him, and you know what they saw in his face? No. I couldn't do that. There's no way. I would get so mad. It's like, man, I get so mad. Look how this one. Generino? Oh, fireball in this car. Still wake up in the middle of the night. Generino! Generino! It's over. He's moved away. Okay. They saw his the face as an angel. So they were against all those things that he, he soundly and lovingly refuted all their things. Hey, I'm sorry. As a Mormon, I believe that Jesus is God, not a God. Oh, you're a Jehovah Witness? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe in the miracle wheat thing. No? No? What about a Muslim? I'm sorry. I just don't believe that uh, Muhammad was, was the prophet of God. I'm sorry. But there was, a, there was a love about his disputing them. He didn't tell them their sin. He just told them what he believed. And if they didn't believe it, that was their business. Listen, they saw his face as the face of an angel. And let me tell you, I looked up commentary after commentary after commentary. I looked up the words. What does that mean? I mean, did like an angel transform his face? And nobody had any other explanation except there was just a peace about him. Because he knew what he believed. He's so filled with the Holy Spirit that it didn't matter who he talked to. He did it with loving eyes and a hopeful heart. He told the truth with mercy and not just love. Listen, I've been there. I know what you're going through. You young folk, I know how hard it is on you. I was there and I failed that test many times. But I'm trying to tell you, not if you don't get your life together, it's going to fall to ruin. But if you don't get your life together, it's going to fall to ruin. The way you're living, I live that way. It ain't going to work. Not you stinking kids! Get out! You ain't paying attention to Bowser twice, I saw. Get out of here! You see the difference? And this is what happens when you have men, not who just show up to church, and they're big tithers, or they knew the pastor from a previous life, or they work for him. They were amongst the people, filled with the Spirit, not duplicity, but sincerity of heart. And they just loved God. And all of a sudden, all their good deeds came to light because they cast their cares upon God. I love this Bible study. There's been problems in the church from day one, guys. Don't ever let problems chase you out of your church. Never. Never think not to come here because you're not perfect. 
because nobody here is perfect. Never think not to come here because somebody said something wrong, did something wrong. There's been problems in the church from day one. Handle it like Scripture says, and you can be a solid foundation stone in this church for a long time to come. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. I love the word that you gave us today, God, and I thank you, God, that, um, that our church doesn't have the, uh, the monopoly on problems. God, I thank you for every problem child you brought to this church, and may we handle it with grace and love. I thank you for every hurting, hurting heart that's here, and may they see our faces, God, as the face of angels as they saw Stephen's. God, thank you. And I ask you, do I, I do, God, for the person, the man that's here, the woman that's here that, that is so sincere toward you, God, that you would bring their good deeds to light, God, that, they would, that we would recognize them as a servant of the Most High God, and they would begin to have a good testimony for you. God, stir up the hearts of those who heard that list and qualifications of elders and deacons today, and in, in, in hurting sincerity, they know how short they're falling. God, give them the strength, God. May it be your, their weakness where your strength is made perfect. God, thank you so much for the love of your word and the love of Christ. May you change us that we would look more and more like you every day. We ask these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen.